topic of our instruction course was nuances hardly seen in textbook right from the horse's mouth. So all the speakers of this uh, instruction course are the most leading experienced practitioners. That's why we have kept it as horse's mouth. I'd like to introduce the speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Josimar Biswasar from Shankar Netrale Chennai. He's a popular figure, everybody knows. Dr. Kalpana Babu from Bangalore Prabha Eye Clinic. Dr. Ratnam Madam, my teacher from Aravinda Yaskul Madurai. Dr. Reema Bansal, she will be arriving shortly from PGI. Dr. Padma Malini, Mahendra Das from Narayan Naitralaya, Bangalore, and myself. So, uh, due to uh, change in the schedule, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Ratnam Madam first before her presentation. She is a uh, uh, most uh, prestigious speaker of UVI Day. She has received multiple awards. Whenever we give award to her, the award looks smaller to her. She looks much, much taller than the awards. That's what I always believe. She has multiple research experiences. It goes on to pages. And she's a PhD guide, and she's a PhD examiner to multiple universities. So she is a popular editor of multiple journals. Name anything in UVA, she will be the editor. And she, uh, these are all popular international uh, journals. Uh, over to Dr. Ratnam, madam, please. Uh, Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be introduced by our student, but uh, I want to be really modest. I, I'm just the product of Aravind. Such a wonderful uh, heading, U-turn in UV8 is, uh, Dr. Bala has given. I will take you th three U-turns in this talk. When do we take U-turn? When the clinical diagnosis is not going in accordance with the course which we expect, when the clinical diagnosis is not going in line with the lab diagnosis, when the clinical diagnosis is going out of the way, the outcome. So whenever these, these three things, four things ma do not match, we take a U-turn. This is a wonderful case. Uh, in 2017, there was a patient with cough and headache and productive cough. Sputum was 4 plus positive for AFB, and he was treated fully with ADT, and he's a worker, uh, uh, ANO in uh, a government hospital, assistant, I mean, what is that, a nursing assistant or something like that. So he had a high history of exposure. Uh, obviously, when he had 4 plus, it was proven that as TB. And he was given nine months full course, and he was serious enough to take the treatment properly. ATT was given, everything was all right. Till 2018, he was asymptomatic. 2018, he again had productive cough, fever, 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 and joint pain. And he had uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, and also he was hypertensive. And uh, people thought it is a recurrence of TB because he is working in a government hospital. Their first uh, thing was to start ATT again. In spite of the fact, sputum was negative. So this unfortunate man underwent ATT once for TB and once for something else. So they were thinking it could be A bacillary tuberculosis with drug resistant. A bacillary tuberculosis, by definition, we are not able to prove the bacilli, but still patient is tubercular patient. And maybe because he had two courses, still he is symptomatic, they thought of drug resistance. And he had hearing loss, he had joint pain, he had severe headache, severe headache. He was, yeah, when he came to my clinic, he was almost rolling on the floor because of the headache. He was, he was begging to give something. And this is the eye picture. All the, all the ophthalmologists will know this picture. And this is very, very specific. See here, as if God has done the surgical excision of the conjunctiva, and there is a necrosis, marked necrosis. 100%, 200%, 300%, it is only venous granulomatosis. 
Only in vagus granulomatosis, necrotizing scleritis with the conjunctival bearing will occur. So na, TB cannot do that. TB may produce scleral abscess or scleritis or sclerokeratitis. Definitely the cornea will have tongue-shaped opacity in TB, whereas this prominent vessel, uh, uh, is, uh, occurrence of prominent vessel with the necrosis, with uh, conjunctival necrosis, only vaginous granulomatosis can happen. So what I did is, I did ESR-CRP. In fact, he was not willing for any test. I spent my money. I, to, I wanted to do ANCAP and it came positive. I, I wanted to prove ANCAP positive, but he was not having any money. All his money were wasted in uh, getting treated for cough and headache. So our diagnosis was frank ANA positive vaginous granulomatosis or microscopic polyangiitis. And uh, then we, we, we asked him a CT scan and see here spinoidal sinusitis. And the headache is because of spinoidal sinusitis. And unfortunately, the radiologist mentioned that it is fungal sinusitis. Radiologist should not go to the etiological diagnosis. They are seeing only opacity. So they should have written only spinoidal sinusitis because they wrote fungal sinusitis. It is very, very dangerous now. So I wrote a beautiful long letter to a multi-speciality hospital because he is uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. It is very, very, very challenging to treat this patient. So I wrote the diagnosis is vaginous granulomatosis and sinusitis is because of vaginous granulomatosis and his pulmonary system is because of vaginous granulomatosis. Because he has uncontrolled diabetes, it is very difficult to treat in ophthalmic setup. Kindly treat with immunosuppressive. But the rheumatologist and the ENT specialist saw this fungus and he, they were very much afraid to touch the patient because he is diabetic. Unfortunately, this patient was also subjected for sphenoidal sinus, sinus surgery to prove or disprove whether it is fungus or not. And fungus was negative. Bacteria was negative, fungus was negative. And the rheumatologist now wanted to do bronchoscopic examination to prove that it is not TB. See that in spite of definitive diagnosis, they put the machine again inside, taking all the risk, and the biopsy came as vaginous granulomatosis. So by that time, the CRP was extremely high. This number, nobody might have seen. Instead of six, it was 129. ESR was 102. Again, the C anchor was positive. And a first result was uh, after the first after the sinus surgery, vision was hand motion. And scleral necrosis increased. At this point of time, rheumatologist safely sent the patient with the diagnosis of vaginous granulomatosis back to me to start the rituximab. He, even at that point, he was not bold enough to start rituximab. Then I, 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 told, I explained everything to the patient. This is the drug you, we have to give, and uh, we will face the consequences. And he was, he was willing because he also still had headache because of cerebral angiitis. So we gave rituximab and everything resolved. It, now you will agree with me, this is not one U-turn, it is multiple U-turns. And everything resolved. See here, conjunctiva grown over the lesion and vision became 618. And ESR was 50, he is symptom free and he is on steroid maintenance. So the highly, whenever the ANA is positive, it is very, very important. It is positive in 96% of generalized disease, positive in 67 in limited disease, positive even after remission in 32%. So this is U-turn enuviatus. He was di repeatedly diagnosed as TB, but he was vaginous. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for your enlightening talk. Uh, we really appreciate your sincere efforts. Uh, Any uh, questions? So I just. What was the reason for that ANT positive in the staff? Initially, he was tuberculosis. Because he was working in a primary health center, uh, he was a nursing assistant. So he had TB. In fact, uh, out of uh, 10, 10 of m 10 
uh, vaginal granulomatosis patients with me, they, are, they had tuberculosis. So there is some connection with this TB antigen and vaginus. So Thank you. And the patient, the one patient can have two diseases because that yeah. nothing prevents to uh, have another disease. Yes. So as a one autoimmune disease, the another is the infectious disease. When you see the TB bacilli, there is a gold standard. Yes. And there is no doubt that is a TB. Yes. Um, do you think that the IV cyclophosphamide would be better than oral cyclophosphamide? Yes, absolutely, sir. We now, right now, he is on cyclophosphamide. Uh, initially, because uh, he was, he had cerebral angiitis, he had multiple system, ritizumab immediately controlled. Then uh, he was not able to afford. So we switched over to cyclophosphamide. Rituximab is a very good drug, visceral yes. inhibitor. Absolutely, and for good veganus. drug for the in, uh, scleritis. It's a very good uh, yeah. Especially veganus cyclophosphamide is very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any uh, special case for tuberculosis? Any? Special case. Is there a case? It is very difficult, sir. We do have some cases like that, A bacillary cases. It is very difficult. In those cases, <coughs> we don't start immunosuppressive first. We give ATT trial first. Within two months, we will know the response. There is no gold standard test for a TB. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Culture could be one close to the gold standard. The <coughs> AB culture. And that one. Thank you for Back your input, culture. sir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now uh, there is a slight change in the schedule uh, because there is a flight for some of the speakers. Next, I invite Dr. Kalpana Babu Murthy for a talk on to respect or not how laboratory diagnosis helped and did not help in my UVA disc cases. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bala, for making me a part of this very interesting uh, uh, instruction course. And uh, I, it is always a challenge to follow Dr. Ratnam. Uh, you know, but I would uh, try my best. And, and this is a case which I've learned quite a bit. And I would like to share my experience with you. So this is a 50-year-old male who presented to us with redness, severe pain. That is, that one-sided pain was unbearable and blurring of vision in the right eye for 15 days. He had no predisposing trauma, surgery, or any systemic disease. Uh, his uh, treating ophthalmologist locally had done some investigations. ESR was around 30. I have just picked up the important ones. So he had a positive ANA. And as per his uh, records, he had a C-reactive protein which was raised. Now, as Dr. Ratnam had mentioned earlier, the range is up to 6. So this was 7. So it was not too high, but it is definitely on the borderline. He also has a history of um, just joint pains, and I think this was more of a leading question asked by his uh, ophthalmologist, but that was definitely on the file. So when he presented to me, he was already on oral steroids, 60 milligrams per day, and also on topical steroids since one week. And when I saw him, his vision in the right eye was 20-30, and in the left eye was 20-20, and he had almost the same symptoms when he came to me. So this is the picture which he had. So this was a diffuse scleritis. And normally when we see a diffuse scleritis, we look for any areas of whitening, yellowing, any pus formation. So he didn't have any. And uh, 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 he had severe pain in that eye. So at that point of time, because he had not responded to medications, for 60 mg at least, he should have had relief with pain. Uh, thing. My slides are not moving. And uh, the cornea otherwise was OK. So I thought, let's just get a few other investigations, like uh, Anka and uh, rest of the investigations. Uh, but he refused everything. And he, I also wanted a B scan at that point of time to see what was happening, and whether he had some posterior scleritis as well, which could account for the pain. He refused everything. And he came back to me after three days with worsening of pain. And there was a drop in vision to 2060. And when I saw his fundus, he had a, a peripheral choroidal detachment in feronasally. So uh, at that point of time, there was a slight uh, elevation in the nasal aspect. But this was 
uh, something which was not very typical of what we see in infectious chloritis. But this was something which was not there uh, uh, three days ago. And this was something which was very interesting because he had these uh, endothelitis-like presentation temporarily and a lot of debris uh, in the cornea like this. Now, this kind of pattern we normally see post-corneal ulcers or during corneal ulcers where they, you have a lot of inflammatory debris sitting on the endothelium. So this was something like that. And we did a B scan and then there was a T sign over there with choroidal detachment. So at this point of time, we said, uh, though there was no marked yellowish lesion, so we said, okay, let's at least go with the needle and go under the, uh, at that area of a slight bulge which was there, uh, explaining the risks to the patient. And what we did was there was definitely pus fluid which was there. And there was so much of necrosis on cytology, and this grew actually pseudomonas aeruginosa. So uh, uh, this patient was started on oral ciprofloxacin, and after two weeks, we had to even start steroids because many of these conditions is a lot of immunological mediation, so which will require steroids. And if you see the improvement in uh, the scleritis from this was the initial, pre uh, the subsequent, the, sector, uh, the time when everything worsened, you see this debris, and then you see things starting to clear off with thinning of the sclera, and then you can start seeing this organization of these exudates on the endothelium. And then this is at the end of two months, and this is after four months. So this uh, person needed ciprofloxacin for nearly four months, and you can see more or less it is quiet. And by then he had a mild proptosis also uh, due to the inflammation, and things are now settling well. So I would just like to go back in this case. So here was a case which had no predisposing factor. There were no areas of pus pointing, necrosis, abscess, satellite lesions, anything which normally which you see in uh, infectious scleritis. And uh, this was misdiagnosed as autoimmune, mainly because of the ANA positivity and the CRP and the ESR. And somehow, because everything added on, the uh, person, the ophthalmologist also asked for joint pains, and that also was taken as something very significant. But there were a lot of pointers in his clinical history which was missed earlier. So the severe pain and one-sided headache, very severe, is usually you normally see it in infectious uh, scleritis. And one needs to have a high degree of suspicion when there is no improvement with such a high dose of oral steroids for at least even a week. And this uh, new presentation of endothelial debris which is occurring with a lot of folds definitely should in uh, point out to infection. And whenever you are in doubt, it's, it's always safe to just take a needle and carefully uh, under, the sub, under the conjunctiva to just look for any pus uh, which is there and subject that to both microbiology and cytology. Now the bacterial scleritis is the most common form of scleritis and out of the bacterial, usually the pseudomonas is the most commonly isolated organism. Now this patient, uh, though we had started, uh, we had recommended ciprofloxacin before the cultures came, the lo he wanted to get it treated locally and he was started on uh, uh, cephalosporins. And he didn't do well for about three days, which was worsening. And a simple drug like ciprofloxacin is very useful in pseudomonas. And with a good dosage of 750 mg twice a day, he definitely did uh, very well. So the lesson which I learned and I would like to share with all of you is infective scleritis can come even if there is no predisposing factors, especially in our part of the world. And this can highly mimic autoimmune uh, scleritis, and therefore we should always have a very high degree of suspicion when we see our patients with scleritis and follow them up very closely if the pattern is changing over a period of time. Now, bacterial and fungal are quite common in our part of the world, and an important drug like ciprofloxacin, but should be given in adequate doses, along with oral steroids, once you start seeing the symptoms getting or signs getting better, if you add the steroids, this definitely helps in pseudomonas scleritis. With this, I would like to uh, uh, end this case and any questions awaited. Kalpana, what is the source of infection of pseudomonas yeah. so, here? Uh, see in this patient, we predict? don't have any trauma, but he's a farmer by profession. So okay. the, 
in India, especially people from the rural background, many times even if they are exposed to the sand and the dust, you are thinking yeah, of. we don't know and they don't come up with that history. So mm. uh, th uh, that could be one of the causes. Because he also had an MRI and all done. Uh, I didn't add this because I thought that would take a lot of time. But uh, his sinuses were clear and there were no focus of infection anywhere else in the body. Apart from the pseudomonas, that another cause of scleritis could be nocardia. Uh, yeah, can also especially be that in rural. And, uh, yeah. Toxoplasma can also produce scleritis. Yeah. It has been uh, reported. But, but these are the very rare forms of scleritis. Yeah. So one should not go with the idea that autoimmune yeah. scleritis would be the top on the list of yeah. your... I think that, that is the reason why the ophthalmologist also started him on uh, took, uh, you know, oral steroids, which actually even I would have done initially. But after one week, even if you don't see and it is worsening, it is always better to keep our eyes and ears open. But I thought what was interesting in this patient was that endothelial debris which was mm. there, which we normally see in infection. And that was an important point too for me to go in uh, subconj and see if there is any uh, pus. Did you scrape culprit? What did you no, there was no areas of necrotizing uh, scleritis, which was visible, obviously. So what I did was with a uh, insulin syringe, I just went under the conjunctiva. And at that time, there was a ooze. And uh, yeah, yeah, and that I took it out and sent it for examination. So that was mainly on s uh, just a suspicion because of the debris which was there in the endothelium. You look for uh, AB also, nice. no? Uh, yes, sir. Normally we do for bacterial, fungal, and. Uh, yeah. Very nice presentation, Dr. Kalpana. Uh, do you consider the contamination uh, by the betadine, which you have um, uh, no, applied uh, before? No, this was uh, done. No, this was done in the OT itself. So no. OT was done, but the uh, uh, before uh, taking sampling, uh, you must have applied the betadine also. Um, no, we it. didn't apply. No. No. But by how would that change, even if you had? Sometimes we may have that uh, pseudomonas. With the betadine, you are putting uh, before the. Uh, uh, you can say, uh, He's trying to say that uh, pseudomonas. Contamination of this uh, yeah. thing. By no, but this is in the OT. No, no. And it in responded the with the antibiotic. In the OT. Yeah. In huh. That is the only thing. And uh, the uh, cephalosporin started uh, previously, must have done that job for the pseudomonas also. No, cephalosporins, uh, at least the ones which they gave, did not work on him. So we were awaiting the culture for 48 okay. hours Sensi and sensitivity. Yeah. We have proved that uh, the, uh, that cephalosporin was not, uh, you can say, uh, ha, useful. So this person, actually, we had advised ciprofloxacin. Uh, we had actually advised IV cipro uh, at that point of time. Uh, sorry, uh, ciprofloxacin. But he wanted to go to his, uh, back to his rural uh, place. So there they felt, because it is an infection, let's give him a, a higher antibiotic. This is my point that uh, uh, if, if we have taken the pseudomonas and we have done the culture sensitivity also, that it may, uh, you can say, uh, uh, more proven your case that that uh, uh, pseudomonas was unresponsive to, to yeah. that civil spirit. Yeah, so that's what I showed a uh, uh, culture swab, which that's was good. sensitive to ciprofloxacin but and the... Resistant uh, to that? Which one? Resistant to the civil spirit. Why no, no, th that we don't know. Yeah, yeah. because so no, if but if the sensitivity chart, that, yeah, yeah. sensitivity chart, the highest sensitivity was for ciprofloxacin, gatifloxacin, the flu uh, fluoroquinolones, yeah, yeah. and in that, yeah, it was uh, they had not done for that particular yeah. cephalosporin. That's my yeah. point. That uh, if, if you right. would yeah. have done that, then it yeah. would be a stronger thing Correct. to rule out the contamination. Correct. Yeah. But uh, he responded extremely well, and this is very See, characteristic. When, when we give multiple treatments, we uh, sometimes don't know that what have clicked. No, see, it, but it if it is ciprofloxacin, it may be the uh, another thing, or or it may be the time. Any antibiotic, if it is an infection, within forty-eight hours of starting an antibiotic, you should start seeing uh, response to at least symptom-wise or maybe the signs. Signs may be a lot later, but you would stop seeing progression and symptoms get better. Now, in our case, he uh, there was a one week of oral steroids and he worsened with development of choroidal detachment and endothelial debris. And then he was started on cephalosporins by his local ophthalmologist and it was worsening. So his pain was worsening. Uh, he just could not, he could not just, he wanted to take his eye off. 
So definitely we knew things are not working. And at that point of time, we just started ba uh, ciprofloxacin. Yeah. And within 48 hours, his pain came down. And we knew it is not, I mean, he may not uh, dr respond dramatically in 48 hours, but he did not worsen either. And that's the time because that one week is crucial because once you feel that it is getting better, then you add the steroid. Because there's a lot of uh, enzymes which are released by the pseudomonas which worsens, it becomes immunological component also. And that is taken care only by oral steroids. There has been a controversy with pseudomonas scleritis, but there was a paper which was published recently and uh, that shows the efficacy of uh, adding steroids with, they had two groups and pseudomonas, uh, scleritis, definitely you do require oral steroids with, uh, I mean the proper antibiotic, yeah. Very, very nice. Thank uh, you. Since I'm uh, running behind time, there are more questions we can ask personally. Please don't mistake me. Uh, like, uh, it was nice that in the first case, the infection was suspected and it turned out to be autoimmune. In the second, it was exactly the vice versa. So, uh, so next, uh, again, there is a slight change in the program. So, uh, next, I invite Dr. Padmavalini Mahindra Das. Uh, for a talk on, I'm a pro-imaging UAT specialist. How did it change my practice pattern? She is from Narayan Naitralia. She had uh, done uh, her graduation from Stanley Medical College and did a DNB in Prabhaya Clinic. She is a member of multiple international societies. She has multiple publications under her name. Over to Dr. Padma, ma'am, please. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Very good morning to all of you. So how did the practice pattern change based on the imaging findings? We'll see a series of cases. Here is a 47-year female presented with redness and pain in the eye, so in the left eye. Visual acuity was 66. She presented in 2016. We could see the circumciliary congestion, fine KP, and she had increased intraocular pressure. We treated her with topical steroids, cyclopegic agents, and anti-glaucoma medications. We did suspect viral in this case. When she had recurrent episodes, the AC tap was done, which came negative for herpes simplex, varicella zoster virus, and CMB virus. We used confocal microscopy as an additional imaging tool to study the morphology of the keratic precipitates in this case which show infiltrative pattern of keratic precipitate suggestive of viral etiology. On here, we could see the disorganization of the nerve fibers along with the presence of immature dentitic cells in the cornea. Patient had couple of episodes of recurrences which again was managed symptomatically. When she had a recurrent attack in 2017 where we could see the nodular or a coin-shaped KP along with other keratic precipitates with AC reaction. We could see here again the disorganization of the nerve fibers and globular form of keratic precipitates with central globular dentitic and infiltrative pattern. Here we would be seeing the PI because this patient had a narrow angle for which it was done. And CMB anterior uveitis was suspected. We have done the AC tap for the PCR. PCR for the cytomegalovirus came positive. So we re revised the diagnosis into CMB anterior uveitis. Of late, we are seeing quite a few cases of CMB anterior uveitis in immunocompetent individuals. Here you could see the active keratic precipitates, circumciliary congestion, the persistence of both infiltrative and globular pattern of keratic pre precipitates with the presence of immature dentitic cells. So at this point, we started the patient on topical ganciclovir gel. When she came back for the follow-up, <coughs> she had a persistence of inflammation. Then we decided we put her on oral valganciclovir 900 mg twice a day. Following the oral ganciclovir therapy, we could see there is a complete disappearance of the keratic precipitates, resolution of the inflammations, the endothelium looks fine, and disappearance of immature dentitic cells. So the patient continued for some time and then the treatment was stopped because it's completely resolved. Patient was doing for some time and then again she comes back with the recurrent episodes in 2018 with the recurrence of anterior uveitis. This time the endothelium did not show any keratic precipitates. However, we could see the active dentitic cells. 
Here again, we start the patient on topical gancyclovir gel. Again, that did not improve. Then we put the patient on oral valgancyclovir. Subsequent to that, we could see there is a resolving inflammation. The patient took it for about six weeks of oral gancyclovir. Then she is continuing with topical gancyclovir gel. As we know, CMB is a molecular diagnostic method. The PCR is an invasive procedure and RT-PCR is the ideal, but practically it is not possible. And we don't have a definitive guideline how long we can give gancyclovir therapy. So in this situation, the imaging method has helped me to assess the activity of the patient and titrate the treatment. So coming to one case, one point, what did we do? Endothelial deposits and identity cells can be used to assess the disease activity in a case of a CMV anterior uveitis. In my work on focal microscopy, we have reported both non-infective and infective. The globular, multiple globular or stippled or non-infective patterns. There could be overlap of infective and non-infective patterns in certain cases. This is a globular and this is multiple globular or tiny stippled. They are seen in non-infectious uveitis like sarcoidosis, VKH, HLA-B27 associated uveitis. The most important one is an infective. Whenever you see a patient with central globular with dentitic, seen in TB or toxo, or dentitic pattern is commonly seen in viral, or infiltrative is again specific for viral etiology. We'll move on to the next case. A 32-year male presented with sudden decrease in the vision since one week. Best corrected visual acuity at presentation was counting finger half meter in the right eye, the 618 in the left eye. This is a fundus examination. Patient had traces of vitreous cells. Here, the disc looks normal. What you could see is annular retinal opacification in the right eye. The left eye fundus is absolutely normal. So when I subjected the patient for autofluorescence, you could see areas of hyperautofluorescence in both eyes. Especially in the left eye, you could see the triangular pattern of hyperautofluorescence. FFA showed disc leak and diffuse perivascular leak with staining of the vessels in both eyes. OCT shows hyperreflective dots suggestive of posterior vitreous cells. Disruption of the myoid ellipsoid zone and the external limiting membrane, which is responsible for the decreased vision. And also, you could see not only the retina is involved, but also the increased choroidal thickness with hyperreflective dots in the inner aspect of the choroid, suggesting the involvement of the choroid as well. Here, you could see the myoid and ellipsoid zone disruption in the outer retinal layer. So what did I do? See, based on the triangular pattern of retinitis, I did suspect syphilis in this case as the differential diagnosis. So when I ordered this patient bilateral posterior uveitis, the right eye more than left eye, coming to the differential in view of triangular pattern of retinitis in the left eye, I did suspect syphilis. When I ordered the thing, the both TPHA and VDRL came positive. Other investigations are all negative. So we managed the patient with injection benzathione penicillin, 24 lakh units IM for four weeks. Follow up, there is complete resolution of the retinal opacification, the improvement of the visual acuity to 6.9 and 6.6. However, the autofluorescence shows mottled hypo with hyperautofluorescence. It's important that we pick up the infectious uveitis with appropriate antimicrobial therapy results in improvement in the visual acuity and the restoration of the vision in this patient. So this is the SDOCT, shows the outer retinal changes. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease caused by the trypanema pallidum. It's a great masquerade. With increasing HIV, we are seeing more number of cases nowadays. The classical presentation, it could be a focal, multifocal, or diffuse retinitis. These are the classically described, whether you have, can have placoid chorioretinitis, or a triangular patch of retinitis, or punctate inner retinitis. These three are the classically described pattern so coming to the one case and one point, in this case, triangular patch of retinitis gave me a clue to suspect syphilis. So this could be a characteristic feature of syphilitic retinitis. We diagnose based on the non-triponymal and triponymal. Both the test has to be ordered and we should treat this case as a neurosyphilis. We'll move on to the last case. It's a 27-year female presented with decreased vision since three days. She gave history of fever. 
Examination of the right eye was absolutely fine. The left eye visual acuity was 624. Intraocular pressure was within normal limits. F fundus evaluation, she had vitritis, one plus, there is an epidemia of the disc. We could see retinal opacification, multiple retinal hemorrhages with tortuosity of the vessel. Here, when you see the OCT, shows altered foveal contour with hyperreflectivity in the subfoveal region, disruption of the ellipsoid zone, and also the disruption of the external limiting membrane. And this characteristic kind of OCT picture we see in dengue foveolitis, which made me to suspect dengue in this case. So posterior uveitis, basically retinitis with impending vein occlusion was suspected in this case. FFA showed really hypo with late <coughs> persistence of hypo with staining of the lesions, perivascular leak and staining of the vessels are seen. So uh, when we ordered the investigations, dengue IgG came positive. The other workup for autoimmune are all negative because this patient had a vascular uh, impending occlusion. Serum homocysteine was also was ordered, which is elevated, so associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. So this patient was put on systemic steroids, tablet folvite, <coughs> for the hyperhomocysteinemia and vitamin B12 supplements. Once we corrected all this, we could see the resolving lesion in this case. So here, the, this particular patient had improvement again, like, you know, completely resolved with the improvement in the visual acuity to 66 six, the long-term follow-up. Coming to the one case, one point, the hyperreflective lesions with the disruption of the ELM and <coughs> In this case, at SRF also, this particular characteristic feature in history of fever with retinitis could be a dengue foveolitis. So multimodal imaging helps us to localize, especially with the multicolor imaging, we can see the level of depth of the lesions. Autofluorescence helps us to study the changes what's happening in the RPE and the Fourier capillaries layer. FFA is useful, especially in retinal vasculitis, vital angiography to study the retinal periphery. Windows and in green angiography is useful to, especially in stromal choroiditis conditions like VKH and sympathetic ophthalmia. OCT helps us to localize the level of the lesion. To conclude, confocal microscopy in addition to endothelial deposits, the dendritic cells can be used to assess the disease activity. Autofluorescence are useful to assess the diseases of the <coughs> RPE and chorea capillary related uveitis. OCT helps us to localize, especially if you have a specific described morphology like dengue foveolitis, it helps us to narrow down with a differential diagnosis easier. Thank you for your attention. I would like to acknowledge my team members. Thank you. I just want to highlight one point. Uveitis, anterior uveitis with raised intraocular pressure, keep possibility of the viral uveitis. Look at the fundus at the periphery to rule out ARN. And if you see coin shaped chaotic precipitate, think of CMB anterior uveitis, which is a now recognized, newly recognized entity. Because the treatment is so different. Here you want to give gansaclovid gel, you need to give oral galgansaclovid, and these patients do respond well, but can have recurrence. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for uh, sticking to the theme of our uh, instruction course with one, one case and one pearl. And uh, it is a really an eye-opener for a lot of the audience in this, uh, in this uh, hall. So for the next talk, uh, we'll stick on to the order that is the tr treatment speaks thousand powerful words. How does treatment response help in clinching my diagnosis? I'll be speaking of this talk. I am uh, Dr. Balamurugan from Aravindai Hospital, Pondicherry, practicing in VAT since uh, 13 years. Treatment response, does it speak? Very often when a child cries, only the mother knows whether the child is crying for hunger or so many other body needs. So similarly, as a treating physician, we have to keep our mind open to, li to listen how does the res uh, treatment going to speak back to us. Very, uh, it can be either a positive response, we are really happy when you get it. It can be a negative response, 
we have to be really skeptical about it and sometimes it will be plus or minus right. so let us illustrate each one of them with the illustrations which you are going to look forward sometime when you have a case a hemorrhagic retinitis is you treat with antiviral there is a beautiful resolution you are happy so you have a frosted branch and it is you treat it it responds beautifully well doesn't know whether the patient had a disease or not we are really happy so these are all the simple situations similarly you see a papillopustular lesion in the hand along with this matted lymph node and you do a skin biopsy it showed a tubercular reaction you start on att there there is a marked resolution of the subretinal abscess that coupled with the vision improvement from hand movements or fcf to 6 by 36 you are pretty sure that you are dealing with the uh, on a safer zone sometime positive response also helps us to navigate some difficult cases so yeah, i had a patient with massive splenomegaly vitals are normal anti segment you see a very faint granulomatous capsis with cells in flare other eye was absolutely normal you see look at the fundus you see a multiple elevated lesion with irregular margin at the macular area suggestive of choroidal lesions so the did an oct found some srf and as you see in the picture did an uh, fundus fluorus in angiogram again it shows dull lesions in the early middle phase becoming hyper in the late phases we had the differential as usual as tuberculosis sarcoidosis syphilis the routine stuff along with the mask rate ordered the baseline investigation now look at the baseline investigated parameters when we order the investigations lot of physicians don't look at the tcdc at all so you can't ignore that see the total count was elevated massively you don't see a 1 lakh 80000 count or elevated platelets then did a peripheral blood smear did a bone marrow aspiration as well as fluorescent in situ hybridization which showed philadelphia being positive with the abr bcl 40 so you got a diagnosis it is cml in an accelerated phase and again this this patient was started on imatinib and hydroxyurea so the inflammation resolved and gradually there was improvement but the srf was not showing a marked resolution so we suspected an associative posterior scleritis and did peri uh, posterior septin on steroids to treat the posterior uh, the srf and the vision improved to 6 by 6 again it is a positive response uh, the beautiful documentation before and after treatment with oct and uh, this cml is a myeloproliferative neoplasm with clonal proliferation of mature cells of the lineage uh myeloid lineage so the basic here is a philadelphia chromosome which codes for the bcr abl protein which is a basically a tyrosine kinase which causes the proliferation of growth of the neoplastic cells so it has m- multiple phases chronic accelerated and blast phase our patient was in a accelerated phase usually it has got a poor prognosis likely with appropriate treatment that was a marked improvement what is this treatment we are given it is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor imatinib and it works really well in these cases why this case although this patient was in accelerated phase there was a marked improvement in the patient getting back the vision of 66 like most refractive surgeons these days do shifting gears we sometimes we get negative response also and we are flabbergasted i what i'm dealing with this so th- this was one such case i had a patient with right eye 66 when the patient first walked in otherwise he was 1 by 60 anti segment in the right eye was normal but for the left eye with faint cells on the macula there was a funny looking lesions around the macula with dull looking multiple retinal or choroidal lesions you could say we suspected viral started oral antiviral along with oral steroid appropriate mantu was then see after 10 days the other eye right eye which was 66 became 6 by 60 the left eye vision became 6 by 36 we ordered for additional test like hiv hbsag and syphilis and everything turned out to be negative this was a fundus with multiple subretinal lesion involving the macula with rp mortally did a oct it showed full thickness hyperreflective lesions and foveal thinning and atrophy this sort of marked foveal thinning and atrophy is very very characteristic of this disease entity let us see what it is did a fluorescent angiogram again showed multiple hypo late hyper lesion at last follow up look at the terrible thinning atrophy of the macula like you don't see at a marked progression of the disease happening in 10 days or within a month or so with so much destructive process happening in the retinal layers so what are the tests we ordered as we said hiv hbsg was negative dengue chikungunya was negative toxoviral filix was negative but this test measles igg was positive 
now you would have got what the diagnosis I am speaking about. Speaking on the course of events, so in a short span of time, the vision which was 6 by 6 became no PL and 1 by 60 there was little improvement for by deterioration to 5 by 60. Now, this, the story is not over. After five weeks, the patient developed neurological symptom, disorientation, loss of voluntary reflexes and latent respiratory failure. The patient was taken over by the neurologist, where did the CSF tap for the uh, measles antibody and the diagnosis, you know, is straightforward now. It is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And there is a Dykens criteria to diagnose subacute sclerosing panencephalitis in which the raised titer of more than 1 by 256 is very characteristic along with the CSF titers, along with the EI characteristic EEG findings. There are different drugs used for SSP. It could be an amantidine, simetidine, steroids, the multiple interferons. The most important one is the isoprenosine along with intraventricular interferons in a combo therapy seems to work out well. Usually, this disease, SSP has got a very poor prognosis. When you read this article, this article speaks about the good prognostic factors in SSP. It says the age of onset, less than 12 years, disappearance of periodic complexes, the tendency to normalization in the background of the EEGs, and the progressive increase in the antibody titers are all going to prognosticate the good prognosis in SSP. When you have such points, you can uh, really calm down the patient because these patients are going to die soon once they present to you with macular retinitis. So uh, how to diagnose SSP? The most important point is there is little or no vitreous inflammation or involvement of the retinal vessels or satellite lesion, unlike you see in other disease entity. When you happen to see these sort of features, macular retinitis with zero vitreitis, zero satellite lesions, be very, very careful that you may lose the patient and the patients may sue you also if you don't pick up on time, it could be an SSP. Basically, clinicians, you have to suspect when there is a lack of steroid response, you could be handling a very, very severe form of infectious uveitis or it could be a aggressive non-infectious like besets or very simple, it, is, it could be a fungal entity or never forget the masquerades or a metabolic masquerade as well as an ocular ischemic syndrome. This slide is very, very important whenever you encounter a lack of steroid response in your practical uh, scenarios. So move, shifting to the last case, this is a plus or minus case. Whenever there is a clash between a clinical sense and investigations, which one you are going to choose? Are you going to believe your sense? Or are you going to believe the investigation parameters? Let us see that. So this was a patient who presented uh, with a funny history of evening rise of temperature and nothing significant from the histories. Anterior segment was pretty okay. The fundus in day one, right eye was looking normal. Left eye, you see a perimacular or inferior to that, uh, choroidal lesions. The right eye B scan was done, it showed an appropriate RC elevation, shallow retinal detachment, did an OCT, focal ISOS loss. Again, there is an ellipsoid zone loss. Be very uh, focused on this ellipsoid zone loss. SRF was also there. And the RP elevations were also documented along with the RD. So what is my diagnosis? It could be a left eye evolving posterior uveitis, it could be TB sarcoid, or it could be a colloidal melanoma. So after some time, what happened was the right eye again got involved, like in the previous case, again there was a choroidal lesions, did the baseline investigation, the ESR was borderline elevated, nothing more, and look at the mantle. It was zero millimeters. I never thought this uh, zero mantle uh, could uh, uh, help me further in proceeding uh, in the navigating this disease scenario. In the late venous phase, you see a punctured hyperfluorescence, and uh, there is an inclip fluorescence in the late phase. In the arterial phase, you see a punctured hyperfluorescence again in the left eye, becoming more in the later stages, hypo becoming hyper. Did an HRCT, it showed a ground glass opacity. So it's not very characteristic of TB or sarcoid. Again, it is plus or minus. We can't believe the radiologist again. Start that we, I should start on oral steroids. And again, since there was a little doubt of melanoma, ordered for an HRCT. Uh, uh, and the radiologist gave the, this diagnosis of early uveal melanoma. We always think that radiologists are very, very clever people and they know much better than this. But not in this scenario. There is an RCS elevation. The fundus showed the progression of the lesion with oral steroids. So it is an evolving subretinal abscess. Again, did an FFA, ordered PCR. PCR turned out to be positive. With believe the PCR at least now, 
with zero mantle, with PCR positive, started an ATT and oral steroids, and look what happened. There was a fibrosis, and the retinitis showed a beautiful resolution, both before and after treatment. Again, why this, I'm presenting this case, none of the investigations except the PCR. PCR reports, you know, dear friends, it comes in two to three weeks in my uh, hospital, and some of the specialist centers, the, you can request to come earlier. But in these three weeks, you are going to treat the patient. So what are you going to believe? So you have to believe, at least with oral steroid, there is a progression, progression of the subretinal abscess. Then you suspect infection, and even with zero man two, we have to start with trial of ATT, and don't believe the radi radiologist diagnosis of choroidal melanoma. It is a, a, a tuberculosis masquerading as choroidal melanoma, and if you ask me how the radiologist gave a wrong diagnosis, uh, are they wrong with T1 hyper, uh, hyper T2 hypo uh, in the uh, MRI? When you have a subtle looking uh, neovascular vessels, which is so common in a uh, tuberculosis, this uh, T1 can become hyper, and the radiologist will just know there is a T1 hyper T2 hypo, and this finding could masquerade as melanoma. So, going to the uh, comparison, and uh, there was no systemic features unlike published, and we all know that TB can masquerade anything. What we all learned in all these three cases, response to treatment speaks thousand powerful words, and than any other investigations, including MRI. Thank you, dear friends. I invite all of you for the upcoming Hyderabad UAT Society of India conference. I just want to highlight one or two points. Subacute sclerosing panencephalitis is a very grave diagnosis, and in such cases, you should refer the patient to the neurologist because there is a neurological involvement is quite uh, um, uh, very important in this case. And they should do the CSF uh, analysis for the anti measles antibody. And um, the treatment is the, the, now available. Otherwise, earlier, there were a lot of patients died. Most of the patients died due to that. It's a very grave disease with a very rapid course. So you should be very careful. Second thing is that negative mantu is uh, not a very unusual in case of tubercular uveitis because in the disseminated tuberculosis, miliary tuberculosis, you get negative mantu test. So negative mantu will not shut down uh, the possibility of uh, uh, tubercular lesion. And then hypoxia is quite common in case of uh, um, tubercular uveitis, uh, tubercular positive uveitis, they can develop I'd say anti vegf has been tried also in case of tubercular subretinal lesion because they produce hypoxia and VEGF is liberated. Thank you, sir. Thank you for highlighting the most important nuances in this uh, cluster of cases. Uh, next, uh, I, I would like to invite Dr. Lima Banzel on a talk on not sure of infectious or inflammatory how do I tackle in dicey situations of clinical practice? Uh, to introduce the speaker, Dr. Rima Bansal is a prolific speaker, and she is from PGA Chandigarh. She has, look, 122 publications, 97 international, international more than the national, and multiple journals with multiple books and awards. She is a member of the International UAT Study Group. She has, uh, she has completed her uh, PhD and uh, she, she, she has a uh, member of uh, uh, multiple research grants of uh, multiple international trials. Uh, I would like to invite her to carry on her presentation. Thank you. Uh, very good morning, all of you. And thank you, Bala, for this kind introduction. And thank you for making me part of this IC. I think congratulations to you for a very well conceptualized IC. The topics are catchy and very, I think, learning, and especially on the last day to see all of you here, it's very nice. So uh, coming on to my topic in this IC, not sure of infectious or inflammatory, how do I tackle in dicey situations of uveitis? Now, before we move on, just a word about the differences between the two, infection versus inflammation. So infection is caused by invasion of the body cells by any pathogen. And inflammation is the body's response to any kind of biological insult, whether it's infection or injury or anything. So infection is not always uh, present with inflammation. However, inflammation is always present with infection. So whenever you have infection, you have to have inflammation. But whenever you have inflammation, it's not necessary that you have infection. 
So first case I'll show you and try to bring about some differences. We had this 43-year-old male, a known case of cutaneous malignant melanoma, having received three cycles of chemotherapy. So he was an immunosuppressed individual, presenting with sudden onset loss of vision in both the eyes, more in the left and more than the right eye. So this is how his eyes looked like. The right eye was having hand motions vision and the left eye had just light perception. Now if you look at the clinical presentation of both the eyes, they are similar but they are very different. They are similar in the terms that there is hypopion in the right eye, there is also fibrin in the right eye, the left eye also has hypopion, the pupil is not dilating. So the similarity is both the eyes have hypopion but the gross difference which you would, which is very striking is there is so much of adnexal reaction in the left eye. It is not so in the right eye. So right eye is like a hypopion fibrinous uveitis and left eye is much more than that. There is chemosis, there is lead edema and partial restriction of the eyeball movements. Now if you have to have a differential, you really don't know what is going on. If you look at the right eye, probably a case of an endogenous endophthalmitis, right? because we are not able to see the fundus in the right eye, just the glow. Now if you look at the left eye, is it a panophthalmitis? Is it a non-inflammatory lesion? Because so much of adnexal reaction, uh, mind it, it is never a part of an endogenous endophthalmitis. So if you have so much of adnexal reaction, either it is pointing towards exogenous endophthalmitis, a history of trauma or surgery which is not there, so we were lost. More so this case posed us a challenge because this guy presented to us on a Saturday evening when your hospital services are shutting down, your laboratories are shutting down and you really don't know what to do. So now the question is, do we go in for the right eye, do we go in for the left eye? Right eye is a little better, obviously you can see and even the vision is better. So should we intervene in the left eye? So what do we do? If we go in the right eye, do we do a pars plana vitrectomy considering it as endogenous endophthalmitis or if we go into the left eye, do we do an AC tap? Because doing a vitrectomy in the left eye is out of question with so much of reaction you don't know what you are dealing with. So we thought we have to save one of the eyes and we were quite blinded by what is going on. So we took up this patient for a right eye vitrectomy, counseled the patient that we think that your right eye is salvageable. We really don't know what we are going to do with the left eye, so at least try to save one of your eyes and try to give you vision. So we did a pars plana vitrectomy in the right eye with intravitreal antibiotics. You can see three days post PPV, the pupil is better dilated, the fibrin is gone, of course he's on topicals also, and the hypopion is gone, and we now start seeing the media. So this disc is visible almost media grade 3 and we are seeing some exudates inferiorly. Obviously we did a core vitrectomy, it is not possible to clear the entire vitreous. So we are little having a sigh of relief that yes and the patient is now seeing about 3 meters. So he is from hand motions to 2 to 3 meters. So we are little better off but we still do not know. Now all the reports of the vitreous sample were again negative in this. Now we left the left eye, we did not know, we got the CT done to see what is going on the, in the orbit. There was just diffuse inflammation in the orbit. Our oculoplastic uh, specialists also were not able to comment on what is going on. So since we left the left eye and one point is that one should never intervene in an eye because when you do not know what you are going to offer to the patient, I think stay back because just for the sake of doing something, when you are not able to do anything, you do not even know what you are going to offer to the patient, I generally hold back and we counsel the patient that we really do not know what is going on. So we left the left eye like this and you can see the, with the IV antibiotics, his chemosis and adnexal reaction is going down. Obviously the corneal clarity is going down, we are losing this eye. So he was no PL, but by that time we had got the CT done and the PET CT done because he was a known case of malignant melanoma. So PET CT was high on our mind and we got it on, it is not easy to get a PET CT in an emergency because we have patients dated for months in our PET CT department. So we had to get this PET CT done on a very emergency basis and it showed that there was an increased FTG uptake among the cutaneous uh, parts, liver and lung lesions and left choroidal lesion. 
So there was an increased uptake in the left choroid and that was suggestive of a metastatic lesion in the left choroid and that manifested the entire inflammatory reaction in the left in the form of hypopion and adixal reaction because there was skin metastasis also. So this is the final outcome of the left eye which we did not touch and this is the three month outcome of the right eye. He's seen counting fingers three meters and he's mobile. So this is what he started with and this is what he became. At least cosmetically we could see at the left eye and we could give him the vision in the right eye. So this case taught us the difference between an infection and an inflammation and we realized that the infection was more urgent to treat with. If you intervene in time, you can at least visually rehabilitate the patient. And when there is so much of inflammatory reaction as we saw in the left eye, and we didn't know what it was till we got the PET CT done. So we left it alone. Anyway, it was a blind eye almost to begin with. Now, when we talk about infection versus inflammation, any of the clinical signs, I don't think there is any clinical sign which would just tell you it's infection or it's inflammation. But I would like to highlight two clinical signs, one in the anterior uveitis and one in the posterior uveitis, which can tell you if you examine clearly that there is an infection or there is an inflammation. For example, when it comes to anterior uveitis, hypopion. When you see hypopion, you may jump to a clinical etiology of an infectious uveitis, but we need to see carefully. Now look at these two different pictures. The one on the left, you can see a red eye. You can see fibrin in the anterior chamber. The pupil is not dilating and there are lots of posterior synechae. On the right, again there is fibrin in the eye, but the eye is cold, there is no congestion. Pupil is very well dilating. There is not much clinical sign except fibrin in the anterior chamber, no posterior synechae. They look quite different and they are different. One is a case of acute anterior uveitis, HLA B27 positive, the other is Bechet's disease. But the similarity between the two is both are inflammatory autoimmune diseases. So here we are not encountering infection. On the other hand, similarly, if not fibrin, let's see a case of hypopion. The one on the left, same findings, congested red eye, non-dilating pupil, posterior synechae. The one on the red, you can see a streak hypopion. On the, the one on the right, cold eye, fully dilating pupil, no posterior synechae, a streak hypopion. Again, both are inflammatory. Another example, now this different situation. The one on the left again has a hypopion, no posterior synechae, fully dilating pupil, quite similar to the one on the right. So do you see any differences between the two? Uh, okay, a convex nature of the hypopion on the right. Anything else? So we, we may not pay much attention to it because here you are comparing the two eyes. But when you see clinically this patient, you don't have a comparison there. So both are hypopion, both are fully dilating pupil, no fibrin in the pupillary area, no posterior synechae. But let's dilate these eyes and see if there is no glow. There's only a glow in the, on the left side. We don't see the fundus. And on the right, we are fully able to see fundus and even do a fluorescein angiography. So what do you think it is? So we are dealing with an endogenous endophthalmitis on the left side, and we're dealing with the Bechet's uveitis on the right side. So this is where the difference between the infectious and the inflammatory etiologies come. So if we have this confusing sign of hypopion, I think we can make our diagnosis and jump to the at least etiology, whether it's infectious or inflammatory. So second case, again continuing with the hypopion, we had this young male presenting with fibrinous uveitis, hypopion, lot of fibrin. Pupil is not really dilating beyond this. And you can see the first differential because he was a young male. First differential was acute anterior uveitis. There was no other history except decreased vision. The second was an endogenous endophthalmitis, but he didn't have any history of predisposing factors. And the third was Bechet's disease, but Bechet's disease was unlikely because this was an acutely inflamed eye and the fundus was not seen. In Bechet's, however dense your vitritis is, at least we are able to see the fundus. So here we could not see the fundus, so obviously we went for an ultrasound. Now the ultrasound showed so much of exudates in the posterior segment that we ruled out acute anterior uveitis. 
So now we are having one possibility of endogenous endothelmitis. He did not have any history and when we are doing the ultrasound carefully, we found there was a retained intraocular foreign body. He did not give any history of trauma, nothing. We went back to the patient, saw him again on slit lamp and we found this conjunctival tear. On coaxing again, he did give a history of trivial trauma and here we revised our diagnosis to retain intraocular foreign body with a post-traumatic exogenous endothelmitis. So this is where you can come to your conclusion by carefully examining the sign and then following up with the relative imaging. The second sign which I said in posterior uveitis is confusing is choroiditis versus retinitis. So as a rule, generally, if you see choroiditis, we are dealing with a non-infectious etiology. And if you see a retinitis, we are dealing with an infectious etiology. Unless the retinitis is of Bechet's, but mind it, retinitis of Bechet's is usually not a very large lesion. These are small retinal infiltrates which keep coming and going even if you don't treat them. So a retinitis of Bechet's disease is not really a challenge, but when you see these kind of lesions, the first one is a granuloma, tubercular granuloma, very typical of TB. You do an OCT and you see this kind of bumping of the retina and the choroid complex. The second one in the middle is a sarcoid granuloma, which is deeper in the stroma. Again, you can pick it up on the OCT. And the third one is simply a retinitis, which you again pick it up on the OCT as the retinal layer is being involved. So this is how we differentiate between an infectious and a non-infectious cause when it comes to choroiditis and retinitis. So to make this difference is very critical in our uveitis practice because appropriately we have to start treatment and you have seen mishaps on treating infectious uveitis with steroids alone. So identify the clinical clues which are not really difficult if you are meticulous in examination. Act aggressively when it's an infectious cause but of course with great caution. Thank you very much. Rima, I just wanted to make uh, comments it's not very unusual to get uh, hypopian in, um, in, uh, due to the tumor. We have seen the retinoblastoma, adenocarcinoma of the lung can produce hypopian. But in case of leukemia, I think leukemia comes first and then hypopian comes later. I have not seen a case where the hypopian is the initial manifestations of leukemia. Most of the cases are diagnosed. But uh, is, if you are taking a uh, tap, from the anterior chamber uh, in a hypopian, it's uh, wiser to make a direct smear also. The cytologist can yeah. make it, the pathologist can look at the cells, even if it is not malignancy, he can look at the polymorphonuclear leukocytes, which will be abundant in infective etiology. And, and then if you see the lymphocytes and histiocytes or lens laden macrophages, that gives rise to the granulomatous pathology like lens induced uveitis. And if we see a malignant cells like lymphoma, metastatic cells, which can be very easily picked up on cytology. Retinitis due to the basis is, is, uh, is not that very big uh, retinitis patch. It's a small retinal infiltrate we yeah. see over there. Thank you, ma'am. It was uh, really a bhavut chandar presentation. Thank we you. really appreciate it. And uh, it was a topic was the most felt topic of the IC differentiating infection versus inflammation. Uh, we are right on time. We'll move to the last topic of our instruction course. Next, I invite Doctor. Uh, this was uh, for his topic on basics do matter a lot. How meticulous anamnesis helped or did not help in management of my case. To give a small intro, Doctor Biswas needs no introduction. Uh, we call him as Sachin Tendulkar of Uvia, <laughs> and now we can brand him as uh, Virat Kohli. Virat Kohli can bat at any position, be it number one or number six. Now he has come to bat at, as a last batsman, and uh, he will always come out, not out, don't worry. And uh, uh, he is a famous Indian first pathologist uh, who did his fellowship from the f famous prolific Doheny Eye Institute under Dr. Rao, uh, and he has published, look at the numbers, 456 sorties in peer-reviewed journals, index, 54 chapters. He has presented 300 papers in national and international conferences. He has given 400 lectures. He has three books. He is a visiting professor of 
P.J. Chandigarh, as well as Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is a principal investigator of 13 research projects. He has multiple fellows. I will call him as father of Indian UVITIS, if it's not an exaggeration. Uh, he is a member of the International UVITIS Study Group, and he is the current director of UVITIS and ophthalmic pathology. What I really like of Dr. Biswas is he is getting younger day by day. So we all get older day by day, but I always used to wonder how he gets younger day by day as he grows older. Over to Dr. Biswas, sir. Thank you, Bala, for the very kind and generous introduction. I don't deserve that. Uh, it's a very different instruction course. I have attended several instruction course. There is uh, the topic which he has given to me. It made me think for a month to see how to make that one. Uh, my presentation is short. I'll be showing five cases. Five minutes, 30 seconds is my duration of presentation. I timed it today. So each case after that, I'll ask questions. You can interact. And um, we can show that how the basics do matter a lot. This is a case, 30-year-old female, immunocompetent. What is your diagnosis? Looking at it. Necrotizing retinitis with few patches of femoral involving the macula is a serious disease. Now the question, what is the diagnosis? Kumar. Leukemia is a possibility because you get that this kind of whitish infiltrate. Any other possibility? I will say that look at the patient as a whole. Don't keep the room light off all the time. And you can get the clue. What is this? Herpes. And indeed, it is a herpetic lesion in immunocompetent patient. This is a very so just a retinitis after IV acyclovir for seven days. The message which I wanted to give, look at the patient as a whole in addition to your slit lamp and indirect ophthalmoscope, which will make your diagnosis easier. This is a routine case uh, referred from Mumbai, one of the case, 43-year-old male, dimness of vision and floaters. He was diagnosed as CMB retinitis. He was HIV positive treated with the intravenous gansaclovir, was not showing any response. At this stage, he came to me. What I do usually to all patients, particularly male patients, shake hands with the patients routinely. And uh, I found something wrong in his hand. What is it? This rash is over there. Shankas, it's syphilis. And then when you look at the fundus, you can see that subretinal yellowish deposits over there. And this was a very telltale sign of syphilitic uveitis. RPR, TPHA come positive, treated with the intramuscular penicillin, and after treatment, how good is the response? You can salvage the vision in such patients. Although it was an accidental finding, but it gave the clue to the diagnosis. I would not have got the diagnosis that easily if I have not shake the hand with, 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 with this gentleman. This is a 47-year-old man, pain, redness, swelling for two months, diagnosed as tumor with intraocular extension. He was diagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma, advised radiation and brachytherapy. He was referred to Sankhanetrale for brachytherapy because the brachytherapy was not available in that center, that three clinic. When I looked at the patient, I found a, a, another case of nodular scleritis, but the nodule looked very big to me. And I kept wondering what is the wrong in this case. I was thinking that in the same line where there is a tumor going inside the eye, but it's not that. There was an ultrasound showed, UVM showed homogeneous mass arising from the episclera and sclera. There's no intraocular mass lesion, only indentation artifact. So clinically, nodular scleral infection, agree. Patient asymptomatically for any major illness. Investigation for autoimmune disease came negative. What could be the rare differential? Think of all rare diseases. Tell me. No cardiac scleritis. What investigation do you do? Biopsy. Biopsy you can do. 
But you know that if all the investigation is negative, one investigation you should not forget in your clinic, there's the last, is the mass spirit can do on. This is VDRL and RPR was positive, and TPHA came later positive. Other investigations are negative. What we are dealing with is a very rare case of nodular syphilitic pleuritis. So the rare case of nodular syphilitic pleuritis with intramuscular benzathione penicillin, there's a marked regression of inflammation. We published this case in the Journal of Ophthalmic Infection and Inflammation, nodular syphilitic scleritis. This is not the usual case, but you should keep in mind open. The mission I learned, sometimes you may need to think out of the box, and then uh, you need to think when everything becomes negative, you should think something unusual and just go for a battery of the test in such cases. So usually we do tailored laboratory investigations, but in sometimes when this came negative, you may need to a battery of investigation. This is a 30-year-old Indian male. He's an Indian male from USA. Metamorphosis of both eyes for 10 days. He came with a diagnosis of serpiginous chorioretis, and they thought this tuberculosis, and they thought the Indian doctor, doctor will be more better treating a uh, tubercular serpiginous chorioretis and refer to me here. What do you think? Is it a tubercular serpiginous chorioretis? Yes, it's an osteoma. Something like, you know, whitish in relation. It's not the yellowish color and bilateral. But osteoma is more common in the female. We did ultrasound. I was suspicious like Kumar. I did ultrasound, and ultrasound showed that the calcific flux in the choroid. See what I found. Then I do it to, to double confirm, I do it. CT scan, it showed elegantly the calcification. Lesson learned, always keep an open mind. Don't get biased with the diagnosis when the patient comes. This is a 57-year-old lady, painless gradual dimness of vision, nine months. I've shown this picture sometimes. But it came, it's very about 20, 30 years back. The patient came and with a nine months treatment of anti-tubercular treatment, nothing happened to the patient. When I looked at the patient, I ah, is what do you think? You see? Anybody? I looked that one and I just thought this is a small uh, leopard skin type of lesions, intraocular lymphoma. I told uh, Dr. Mahesh Shamugam, uh, that who was the veterinary consultant, let's do a biopsy. He did fine needle aspiration biopsy, and then fine needle aspiration biopsy indeed showed necrotic background and the lymphoma cells. Lymphoma showed a necrotic background, and um, this case was indeed a large cell lymphoma, and which you call primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. Uh, that, and then. Six months after, patient developed CNS lymphoma. However, the patient died. The patient's son, interestingly, donated money to our institute with the telling that the, my mother died with a definitive diagnosis. She was treated with a tubercular chorioritis, and he was, uh, she was not responding. So you support the diagnosis of research in your class institute. I would like to donate money. So be mindful, be careful about the subtle sign. It will give clue to the diagnosis in certain cases. This is a 35-year-old man, dimness of vision one month, diagnosed as chorioritis in another center, treated with the IVMP, did not show response, it got worsened. What is the diagnosis? Chronic CSR. Chronic CSR. What is the clue? The central clearing, central clearing. That Chorioritis heals from the periphery. It is healing from the center. So this is central clearing. This is a fibrin material gets clearing. So I did FFA, and FFA showed indeed multiple leak CSR. This is a diagnosis. You should not miss it. So what is the lesson? You may not have the clinical signs all the time, but you should do FFA in all cases of active chorioritis.
I don't do in toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, but all cases I do FFA, which can give a clue not only to a choroiditis state, stage of the choroiditis, also and, um, live, rule out multiple XPSR. Now, finally, this is a 15 year old girl, sudden blurring of vision, right eye, vision counting finger at 50 centimeters. Diffuse KP started over the cornea. I thought it's a pan UVA due to the TB or sarcoid. And these are lesions. Can you guess that what it could be? There's a lot of haze. I couldn't see the fundus. Any diagnosis? I was thinking as a granulomatous uveitis, why not to rule out Mantu test and uh, Sierra Macy? All came negative. Then I do, let's do the PCR, AC tap for PCR. We thought that PCR is a panacea of all infectious diseases. It came positive for MPB64 gene for TB. I said, okay, I got it. I put the patients on anti-TB treatment with topical and systemic steroid. With the systemic steroid and topical steroid, the media cleared. Now what I see, what is this? Toxocoriditis, you are absolutely correct. So I was misguided by the PCR. I didn't do ELISA for toxoplasma. That was a mistake I made. But it was not too late. I, actually, when I don't understand, I keep the patient following every other day. So I was misguided by the PCR. Later I did ELISA for toxoplasma gondii, IgG came positive, and the patient responded well to the treatment. So after 33 years in the UVA, I am still learning from my mistake, from my uh, clinical judgment, and it's, we are all still in the learning process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It was really uh, a great thing from your stature that you are telling that you are still learning. You are learning from your mistakes. And not many ophthalmologists will uh, just say in an open podium like this. The most important lesson I learned from you was uh, whenever I don't know the diagnosis, I keep asking the patient to come every other day. Yeah. So, uh, so you dynamically reassess the situation. Uh, the patients and patients' clinical signs will really give you uh, a clue the, how the signs are changing, how the, uh, there is a dynamic change in the morphology and configuration of the lesions are. And uh, uh, the another important tool you gave us was uh, always do uh, imaging in a choroidal lesions. Uh, so don't mistreat uh, CSR with uh, uh, as choroidals and keep bombarding with steroids and people will laugh at you. So you'll have to be really, really careful uh, not to mistreat CSCR as choroidal lesions. Uh, so the, the, we often spend a lot and lot of time and energy to order for fancy investigations. But most important thing in UVI is 85% of the diagnosis in UVI it is comes from proper listening to the patient's complaint and doing a focused investigation and not do all the investigation for all the patients. If you have a focused approach to all the patients, definitely you will definitely try to clinch the diagnosis. And uh, if after the uh, workup and plan of treatment, always uh, pay attention to the uh, change in the signs, change in the appearance, have a plan in mind, plan A, plan B, plan A if it's going to work, what I'm going to do. Plan B, if it's not working, what I'm going to do. Plan C, if it is plus or minus, what I'm going to do. Only then you will be able to navigate with a clear guidance and your magnetic compass will guide you to propagate, uh, to uh, carry on forward. And even after that, you're not able to handle cases. Experts like Dr. JB, Dr. Rima are there. You can discuss them, or send a mail or discuss in the UATS forum. We are there to uh, guide you to navigate further. If there are any more questions, uh, I will invite you to ask us in person. We have rightly finished our instruction course on time. I thank all the co-instructors uh, for being a part of this wonderfully designed uh, instruction course. I can have time to accept yeah, one more uh, question. We yeah. are very thankful to all of, all of, <laughs> all of you. Uh, it is regarding that uh, SSP. Yeah. In SSP, you have that full thickness in fact of the posterior bone, but in the periphery also you have oval lesions, oval multi coalescent lesions and with, with scalloping of the borders and those are very characteristics of a SSP. Yeah, Thank, thanks a lot for beautifully highlighting this wonderful point.
Thank you. you. Give a hand to Bala for unveiling a very different type of instruction course. Yeah. I invite uh, Dr. Limon to have a snap with you.